Okay, so now we are live and we will just wait for folks to start joining. I still haven't figured out a way to have music playing. I should have had music playing for our music session. <laughs> All right, so we've got folks uh, starting to enter the webinar now. Welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait um, just a little bit as folks join us and um, please feel free to chat um, where you're joining us from today. We love to see um, all the different places where folks are tuning in from. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us today and spending some time um, with our amazing panelists um, to share resources and experiences and tips on using uh, music with our loved ones. Um, we're really excited, so we'll get started shortly. Hello from Texas. Got some other Texans in the room. We know Susan Phillips. <laughs> yeah, we always love to have friends join us. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, Susan. <laughs> All right, we'll just get started shortly. Um, so while we're waiting, just a few um, housekeeping uh, notes. We will be um, making lots of time for Q&A throughout um, our discussion today. Please feel free to use either the chat function or the Q&A function, which I will be um, managing. Hello from Canada. Hi, Sandy. Thanks for joining. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll be pausing throughout and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. Um, if anyone's interested in asking a question live, um, please feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you um, so that you can um, ask your question to our panelists. We're so excited to have Tara, Meredith, and Kathy join us today. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over and um, enjoy. Okay, we wanted to start today just by kind of briefly introducing ourselves and our background um, and kind of what brought us here today. Um, I'm Meredith Hammonds. I've been a music therapist for uh, well, longer than I probably want to admit at this point. Um, I was drawn to music therapy in high school and specifically knew even way back then that I really wanted to work uh, with older adults, which of course also meant working um, in dementia care. And I am so passionate about the effect that music can have on older adults and just how powerful it is um, with helping people recall memories and most importantly, helping people make connections. Um, so I absolutely love what I do clinically. Um, and a lot of people now are so aware of the fact that music is really, really helpful with dementia. And we've seen videos, we've read news stories. Um, but what all three of us found in our clinical work was that a lot of times people know that music can help their loved one, but they don't know what to do about that information. Like they have the information, they're aware, uh, but they, they don't know what to do with that information. Um, and as music therapists, all of us obviously are very trained on how to use music to reach people, to reach non-musical goals. But what all of us had talked about is there's a lot of ways that anybody, even with no therapy training or no musical background, can use music effectively with their loved one to have a meaningful conversation and to help them recall memories. Um, and so that's kind of where the idea of the book was born. And we said, can we create a resource that anybody could pick up, that anybody could use so that they can enjoy music making uh, with their loved one and also really get some of the benefits of music. And so that's kind of what brought us here today. Um, and I'll let Tara and Kathy introduce themselves briefly as well, turning it over to Tara. Hello, uh, so I am Tara Parks Jenkins now. So I'm actually Tara Jenkins, but I think my name still says Tara Parks. So if there's confusion there, uh, but I have been specifically in the dementia field for the last 13 years, uh, which is kind of crazy when I sat there and did the math, but um, I've worked in lots of different roles. So um, I've been an activities director in a long-term care community. I've developed and implemented a music therapy program in a long-term care community. I've had a private practice as well. I now work for a private practice here in Texas. And so in all those different roles, um, not only was I an advocate for those living with dementia, but I was also an advocate for the care partners and the caregivers, uh, whether that was CNAs or whether that was a loved one, you know, a family member or a friend. Uh, who is caring for their um, loved one living with dementia. And so when we were talking about writing this book, 
um, I have a real passion for supporting the caregiver. So that's what really drew me into this is creating a resource that can be user friendly, you know, a resource that caregivers have so much on their plate already. We didn't want to bombard them with like more homework. We essentially wanted them to be able to just take the book and go and we'll kind of go into that in a little bit. Uh, but that that's really what we were trying to do is really give something to the caregiver that um, they could break up their day. So in, you know, their have all the tasks, you know, ADLs and making sure that dinner is ready and, you know, cleaning and cooking and, and all of these different things, doctor's appointments. So could they find a moment in the day uh, to have a meaningful connection and get back to the connection that they had with their loved one maybe before the disease started to progress? So uh, if you can't tell, that's, that's really where my passion is. So um, I will take it over to Kathy there so she can introduce herself as well. Hi, I'm Kathy Bethy Hensel. I've been a music therapist about 10 years. I spent more than five of it, I think, working with these lovely ladies up in Austin. And um, a couple of years ago, actually left to pursue a research degree because that's where my passion lies, is I want to understand more about why the brain does, it, what, does what it does. I want to understand why, scientifically, the music has its effect on the brain. And you'll hear a little more about that when we get into the, the playlists and how the research back and all of that. For me, I am a clinical music therapist. I'm also a professor. And so my passion is about educating, about helping people take these resources, about making them useful, helping people understand what you can do with as little, um, it's kind of our theme today, what you can do with or without training, with or without musical knowledge, and how everybody can use music. You don't have to own music or be particularly American Idol good at music to be really, really benefited and helped by it. Um, okay, so let's get into more of the meat of the webinar. I'm going to be talking a little bit about why music is so important with older adults. Um, and then a little bit about what music therapy is um, and then kind of what the book is. Um, so in general, music therapy is so important with dementia because we've seen with the research over and over again um, that as the disease progresses, what people can do through music and their musical abilities remain intact far longer and kind of out of sync um, with whatever their regular functioning level is. So even as the disease progresses and as we experience decline, um, we always see that their response to music is up here while their regular response might be down here. And even as it fluctuates and goes down, that musical response um, is always higher. So a classic example, um, and I know I've seen these videos all over the news. If you've seen the movie Alive Inside, there was great footage of this happening. Um, and it's something as music therapists, like it was funny watching the film because like we see that every single day at work. Like that's what we do at work every day is watch this response. And um, it was exciting to see it captured on video because other people are like, oh my gosh, have you seen this? And I'm like, yeah, every day. That's why I go to work in the morning. Um, so that classic response would be, you know, you have someone that has dementia and maybe they're having difficulty. You might be asking questions about their day um, or about their life or about their family and they're really struggling to recall and they're re struggling to recall memories, to recall um, anything about their identity or their past and then you play that song that's somehow connected to their life, maybe in childhood, maybe as a young adult, and suddenly Betty, who was completely not responding to anything, sings all the words, right, and then tells this amazing story um, somewhere in her past about a time she experienced that song. And um, even though there's, there's so many videos and so much research and so much that we see about that, I got to say, it, it kind of never loses its magic. When you have that moment, it really, really never loses um, the magic and it's, it's so wonderful to see um, because I think one of the biggest challenges with dementia um, is not that just that you're forgetting, but when you start forgetting your stories, forgetting your past, it's very hard. You're essentially forgetting who you are. Um, and a lot of times it can lead to this depression because you're isolated, right? It's harder to connect with others. It's harder to interact with family members or with friends um, when you're unable to recall things and you're unable to remember but also you don't remember who you are, where you've been, what you've come through, and there can also be this depression from this, this loss of identity. 
Um, and music kind of really helps people regain their personality, regain their life story, um, regain those memories at least for a while and say, oh yes, this is who I am. I'm this cool person and I have these stories and these experiences and I can share them with you and you can understand them and respond to them. Um, and that's, I think, really at the heart of why music is so important. Um, we're not going to get too heavily into the research. There is research as to why that happens, right? And we are very fascinated about that. Um, and in short, it has a lot to do with how music is processed in your brain. Um, we know music is the only sensory feedback that's processed in all areas of your brain simultaneously, right? So there is, there is no such thing as like the musical part of your brain because the music is everywhere. It's in the part that controls motor function as rhythm. It's in the part that controls speech as lyrics. Um, it's in the amygdala, which is very key, uh, which controls your emotions, right? And so it's deeply ingrained across all areas of your brain and people are starting to look at that and saying, well, this is why, why when other, other functions are being lost, that musical function remains intact and has, has to do with the way it's stored neurologically. Um, for me as a clinician, I love to know the why, I love to know the research, but my biggest thing is how can I make my clients' lives better? Um, how can I make their caregivers' lives better? How can we use what we know about this um, to really improve, improve their life and help those connections? So in therapy, um, a lot of times we use the music and encourage them to recall those memories and share those stories. So that's a huge part of it, is we want them to be able to do that. The other part is really a social aspect, right? We want to use music as a way to create those connections. Um, and then when they're in, able to engage with family members or with peers, if they're in long-term care, they're getting that social feedback that we all need and that we all thrive on. And they're feeling that they're a part of the group and they're connected. Um, and this, from my experience, happens a few ways. Uh, number one is the classic, we hear the song, we recall the memories, and they share a story. And what I love is I've had, uh, not that long ago, I had clients, they were talking about during World War II as children, they had to mix the yellow dye into like the fake butter to make it look like real butter. And then another lady's like, oh, I remember that was my job too. And now, now they're sharing these common memories that they had and they're having these wonderful conversations that started because the music helped trigger those memories. Um, the other way that it can really help is obviously as Alzheimer's progresses, we might not always be able to see those verbal responses. Um, and they might not always have, and even if they're normally able to, they might be having a day where they're having a harder time. Uh, but with music, they can still be singing or humming or tapping their toes. We bring a lot of maracas and instruments and they're able to play without necessarily having to verbally participate or verbally process. Um, and they still know that I am a part of this group and they can feel the energy that they're part of the group, they're connected to their peers. Um, and I think that is so, so, so huge um, for reducing isolation. Um, we also know that as different abilities uh, fade um, and decline, that rhythm is one of the very, very last things um, that does remain intact. And so when I talk about using music with dementia, I always like to bring this up because this is a response that I feel gets less press coverage than what we see, you know, when they sing the words of their, their favorite song. Uh, I've observed so many clients in groups that maybe seem non-responsive to other things. They may not engage when I ask them how their day is um, or encourage them to, you know, respond with me that way. But when we do a song that they know or that has a strong beat, you'll see those toes going and they're tapping and they're right in the beat. Um, and they are still participating. They're still connecting to that rhythm. They're still feeling the music. Um, one of my favorite stories to share about this is one of the exercises I do as a music therapist is we do uh, kind of like a modified drum circle. It's freestyle drumming. So they get to play any rhythms that we want. And we do a little bit of work um, with loud and soft. And what I do with my groups is I lead for a while and then I like to bring participants up to take a turn leading. Um, and one day I was doing this, I work, one of the groups I work with is a respite care group for folks with dementia that are still at home and they can come in and they do all kinds of fun stuff together and cognitive exercises as well. So we were doing drumming and I brought up one gentleman, um, his name was Bob and he was so into it and his whole face was alive and he had his drum up high, he had his drum down low, he was going around the group making purposeful eye contact at every participant, making sure they were connecting with him in that moment and they were following his lead and they were just like eating it up, they were just giving the energy back to him. It was incredible and like I completely forgot that like he had dementia and that how how far into the dementia um, he was 
until he finished playing. And then he stood there and we all were like, woohoo, Bob, and he's got all the applause. And I said, Bob, go ahead. That was fantastic. Go ahead and, and go take a seat. And he just looked at me. And I ended up having to kind of gently guide him to his chair because that was where we saw he had dementia and he couldn't process the direction. He couldn't remember where his chair was, even though there was only one empty chair in the entire room. It's not a big room. Like there was one right in front. So he just, he couldn't remember. But in the music, I mean, he was, I would say just like anyone else, but his drumming was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it was better than normal people's. And to be able to share that experience with people and give them that, that they can be a part of the group, they can be leading the group, and they can be showing off their talents. Uh, for me, that's really, um, really what's it, what it's all about. So essentially, I'm getting kind of long-winded here, but essentially, because of that way that music's processed in the brain, because of the way that people still respond to music, even when they've stopped responding to other things, because of the way that their musical abilities are intact, uh, at a much more advanced level than the rest of their other abilities. I think that is really why music is so absolutely important um, with people who have dementia, because it gives them that social connection, it helps them recall memories, and it also helps them tap into their emotions and they can express them and share them um, and have the emotional experience as well. So as music therapists, our job is whether we're working with individuals or groups is to really use music um, we assess the client, we see where they're at, we come up with a treatment plan, we have goals and objectives and we're tracking progress. Um, and from session to session and also within the session, we are modifying what we're doing based on what we see for client feedback. And if they're doing really well, we're saying, how can we make this a little more challenging? How can we get a little bit more out of them? How can we get them to recall a little bit more? If they're struggling, if they're having trouble with responses, then we automatically come in and say, okay, how can, how can we take it down a step? Um, maybe we need a few extra verbal prompts. Maybe we need a little bit of a hand over hand assistance to get them started. That's what we're trained to do. We're trained to do music to be not just using music to achieve those non-musical goals, but to be modifying from session to session and within the session to make sure that we're meeting them where they are specifically in that moment, but we're also encouraging them to get as absolutely as much out of the experience as possible. Um, and that's really our area of expertise. Now, despite the fact that like we're trained and that's our area of expertise, one thing that really inspired the book is we said, there is a lot you can do that you don't have to be a music therapist to do. Um, and there are ways to share music. And obviously everyone knows like you can play their favorite music for them. You can put it on, just let them listen. But there are a few simple things that you can do to get more out of that experience, to kind of encourage, you know, what happens when your loved one hears a song that they love and they recognize it, how can you dig a little deeper um, to turn that into a longer dialogue? Or how can you encourage a little bit of movement with the song? And so the idea really um, with the book, which we're talking about is music memory meaning is, even though we don't expect, you know, Joe off the street to, to do what we do, there's a lot that Joe can do that can really, really benefit his loved one. Um, and obviously as Tara talked about, benefit him as well, um, because it's not just always about helping or caregiving for people with dementia. It's about caregivers also having a positive experience, having fun with a loved one when they've been so focused on the less fun aspects of dementia and doing that. So the book is really our way of saying, here is a guide. You don't have to be a great singer. You don't have to be a great therapist. This is what to do. This is how to choose music. This is just some very simple ways to kind of walk you through um, getting more out of that experience. And then our goal is, um, if you need a music therapist, call a music therapist. But if you don't, uh, have some ideas, have some ways, have some resources that you can take everything we know about the power of music with dementia um, to help you and to help your loved one. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and kind of turn it over to Kathy. She's gonna talk about one of the sections in the book um, and a little bit about how to choose what music, like what music do you use? Because we keep saying it's powerful and it recalls memories, uh, but not all music does that, right? Like you can put on something and your loved one might just sit there and be like, I mean, I can put on music sometimes or my husband plays something I'm like, um, so, so how do you, how do you get those magic moments? How do you choose music? So you get that light bulb moment and they say, oh, I remember this and they, and they come alive. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to talk a little bit about that. All right. Thank you. Um, 
it's there is so much music out there and it's so easily accessible nowadays with Spotify and YouTube and streaming and collections and digital and analog and all of that. And we sat down to write the book and went, there's a lot of music out there and we have no idea what songs are going to be best for everybody because there's no song, one song that's going to be the best for everybody. So what we did was we put together our playlists first by asking a bunch of other music therapists who work with um, older adults and loved ones who have dementia and said, what are some songs that work? What are some songs that get responses for you? And we put out a survey and we got 50 different music therapists to reply and they sent us something ridiculous. I, I don't even remember how many songs. It was pages upon pages upon pages. I want to say it was almost 500 songs that they sent us and probably more actually. And it was, it was too much. So we sat down and we looked at how popular each song was. We compared it to billboard charts. We sorted them by genre. We sorted them by decade. We sorted them by holiday. We looked at all these different things. And then we looked back at what we know as clinicians, what we know from experience and what we, what we learned and what the research has shown us is people respond the best to music that they know. And the music that you learn in high school, in early adulthood. And those songs are the songs that'll stick with you. This, um, I like to call it being on the music train. And when you're a little kid, you hear the songs of your parents and your grandparents. And then as you're growing older, you strike out into musical independence. And right around the early adolescence, it gets very, it's a personal connection you make with music because you find your music. And you drive your music all the way until a certain point, typically late 20s, early 30s, you fall off the music train. You found your music, you know what you like, this is what you listen to, and that's what you enjoy. Some people stay on the music train for the next 70, 80 years. Some people get off at the age of 21, and that's it, and that's what they do. And everyone's a little bit different. But the research shows us that if you look back to when your loved one was in high school, when your loved one was in their early 20s, what music was popular? there's a good chance that's gonna be the music they know. And so we looked at our, the book, we started with, we started with music from the late 1800s and <laughs> started the playlists in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And we did a playlist for every decade. And what we did was we took the music that was most commonly used by music therapists in group settings and we took the music that was in the top hundred of billboard of every year of that decade and combined them together and figured out where it crossed and had some very spirited conversations about which songs belonged on which list did this go is this rock and roll is this not rock and roll is this where does that go is that 70s is that 60s does it go in both and ultimately came down to these playlists and the whole section of our book is just playlist upon playlist upon playlist of music so if you know your loved one loves country music. You turn to the country list and there's about 40 songs on there across several different decades of popular country music. And if you know your loved one loves rock and roll, you turn to the rock and roll list. And if you're not sure what type of music they like, you just turn to the decade list. And okay, these are the top 20 songs, not top 20, but these are 20 of the songs that were really popular in the 40s, in the 50s. And we kept an eye as we picked our songs on songs that you could talk about songs that you could relate to, songs that you can have a discussion about, songs, some of them we chose because you can move to them. And I know Tara's gonna talk about that in a few minutes, how to engage with the music. But really what it comes down to is songs that you know. And if you know some songs that you've shared with your loved one, those are gonna be the ones that have the best connection for you and for them with you. And if you have no idea what they like, start with what happened when they were 20, when they were in high school, and maybe move a little earlier. Maybe they're very much into the music that their parents or their grandparents played growing up. Or maybe they hated the music of their generation and you've got to go up or down. You're not doing anything wrong if you put on a song and because think about it. How many of us love 100% of the top 40 of the entire time we were in high school? Not a thing. So you might just hit the wrong song. So, okay, obviously that's not the right song. Let's try something different. Don't get discouraged. Try another song. And out there, and hopefully in the lists of hundreds of hundreds of songs, 
there are several songs that are generally popular and that'll pretty much get a good response. So, this and I saw, I, um, I saw a yeah, question in the chat. Yes, yes, I was just gonna say, there is a question from Hillary about um, where one might find that list of 500 plus songs. Well, the full, full list of songs, um, the list that we curated out is in the book. And we didn't post it up on the internet, we put it in the book, separated by playlist, about 20 songs, 20 to 30 songs per playlist, I think we decided, because we didn't want it to be overwhelming. The overall 500 list of songs hasn't been posted or shared yet. Um, I am working on trying to get that in publication in a research article because of the way that we backed it and did all of that. Um, yeah, it hasn't publicly been posted yet, but. I have a, a quick comment. If I can just jump in there. Um, I think the other thing too is a lot of times like we, we maybe from 50 therapists had one therapist who recommended a song. Um, and I know our, our goal um, is 500 songs is really, really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So it's for us, it was a big difference. If we have 40 people that are like, this song is fantastic. Everyone responds to it as a huge response rate. That's very different than one therapist is using one song. Um, and the other thing we try to really watch as therapists is there is, um, we're not completely objective, right? Like we have songs that we tend to know and we work to be as objective as possible, but we have might, some songs that we might gravitate to more. Um, so occasionally as a therapist, somebody could be using a song that's getting a decent response, but isn't necessarily the best response. Um, so when we looked at the data, we really wanted to kind of get out some of that subjective, the therapist is choosing the song, but maybe not because it's the most popular, but because she hasn't been that way. Um, but we really wanted to look at, we don't want to overwhelm caregivers and say, here's the top 500 songs. When some of those 500 were used by one, one therapist or two therapists, what we really want to say is we want you to be successful. You can find a list of songs anywhere on the internet it's actually pretty easy. Lots of sites post playlists. Our frustration with those playlists is you have to really dig through to find the good stuff, right? Like what you need is a curated list. So our goal was to not overwhelm, but say, this is really the songs where a huge percentage of people are getting really, really strong responses because that's going to make it more successful from the get-go. Um, and one more comment along in with that um, is in the book, there is a questionnaire um, because I think the number one thing we sometimes get from people is um, they, they don't know what their loved one liked or they didn't have that conversation um, and they're not 100% sure where to start. There's a, there's a questionnaire to help guide that process as well. And I'll turn it back over to Kathy. Well, I was going to say, Plank, going off of what you said about there, some songs where one or two people recommended them. And yeah, I don't think we included anything that fewer than three or five people recommended. The other thing that we did that makes it different than the internet is we test ran the playlists. Yeah. We each took the playlists and we test ran a bunch of the songs clinically and we sent it out to a bunch of test readers before we published the book and we said, hey, try these playlists out. And they were not all music therapists. We had test yeah. readers who were caregivers. We had test readers who were professional caregivers, some who were um, living at home with a loved one who had a spouse or a parent who had dementia and others who were um, activity directors. So we had an LVN who was working in a care home and we asked each of them to try the playlist out and we adjusted them and we, they were like, hey, we noticed you listen to the country list, but we noticed this is pretty much all Texas country. Well, the three of us live in Texas. So we changed the country playlist and we added more from a different era and stuff that we three didn't know as well. So that's really what makes it different than hitting Google and typing for good songs from the 40s, good songs from the 50s. You're gonna find a lot of the same songs on the lists, but the difference is our list is nice and condensed and targeted. And we tried to put on a good balance of fast songs, slow songs, singable songs, movable songs, listening songs, different themes, different artists, male, female, all of that sort of stuff. So we put a lot of thought into rounding out that list so there'd be something on it for everyone and a variety that makes the whole thing listenable. Yeah, and to um, piggyback off of what you said too, you know, as Kathy said, we curated the lists. We individually came up with our own lists. So before we even sent out a survey, we individually said, here are the top songs in each decade, in each genre. We have Broadway musicals on there as well as country and some other styles. 
we said, this is what we get a response out of no matter what group I go into. So I could go into a group I've never met before and I'm gonna use these songs and pretty much there's a, a high percentage I'm gonna get a response out of it. Uh, the other thing, you know, with that list of 500 and it being overwhelming, you also have to take into geographically where folks are. And so that's something we took into account as well, because as Kathy mentioned with Texas country, um, I'm originally from the East Coast. Uh, you know, and so there were different songs that were popular in early in my career that when I moved to Texas, they were not popular out here and vice versa. So, um, you know, we took all that into account to have these lists be broad enough that they could apply to anybody, but then also curate it that we know they get a strong response, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, Kathy, do you have anything else to add? I don't want to cut you off before I go into the next well, part. I was about to turn back to you, but the one right. other comment that I had yeah. was the other thing that we did that was really different was we limited the number of songs by the same artist on each list. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the 60s, you think the Beatles, but our list is not 30 Beatles songs. There's a couple on there that are particular ones that we've had success with that our other therapists have had success with. And that doesn't mean you can't use the other Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. If that's what your loved one likes and you find that out, then go for it and do more. But we wanted to provide a more well-rounded, a little bit of everything. In case, God forbid, someone doesn't like the Beatles, then yes. you have some other <laughs> options to work as well. <laughs> Apparently, there are people out there who don't like them. So, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tara for the next part. Uh, so the first part of the book is a lot of what Meredith talked about. The second part of the book is a lot of what Kathy talked about. And then the third part of the book, uh, the last part is these engaged listening discussions. And so we have over a hundred of them and they're each based on an individual song. And essentially what we wanted to do was take the music further. You know, we as therapists, we go in and we have all this information about the music and we're engaging and asking questions and trying to reminisce uh, with our clients and, you know, with the caregivers and loved ones or whoever's present for the group. Uh, but we were wanting to to kind of um, put together discussions where you could do that, where it was kind of effortless, where you didn't have to think about the questions. You know, you hear a song and, well, I don't know what questions to ask, or I don't know how to engage my loved one, you know, the song's playing and what do I do with them while the song's on? So uh, each engaged listening, I'm gonna just show it and uh, we'll have these resources sent, there it is. Uh, so that's all shook up and that's just kind of the top of it. But I just wanted to show you that the way it was broken down was we talked about the name of the song, the composer, who made it famous, who performed it, uh, the year it was released. And then the next section is additional information. So any fun facts about the song? Was there an interesting story on why it was written or how it was performed or uh, you know, with Love Me Tender, it's a borrowed melody. It's from a different melody. So, you know, that would be in there. So we would add a couple things like that, which would foster discussion before you even hear the song. And then the engaged listening comes in. So for the engaged listening, it's what do you do while the song's on? And so, you know, just to pull from All Shook Up, engage your loved one to shake different parts of his or her body. So shake your hands, shake your feet you know, shimmy your shoulders a little bit. Uh, and the whole idea is to have that engagement while the music is on and uh, to encourage you and your loved one to connect with the song that's on. And then after the song's over, we had some meaningful discussion questions. And again, as Kathy mentioned with the playlist, these were spirited uh, discussions that the three of us had on what questions to include and what to focus on. Uh, and we wanted to make it broad because we didn't want anything to be too specific. You know, we always, we mentioned this in the beginning of the book, but you always want to start with yes or no questions. If you have an individual who is having communication difficulties, and then if you can expand and ask more open-ended questions as appropriate. So we do guide the reader through how to do that. So we don't just give you all these questions. Um, but a lot of the questions in the book, we start with yes or no in meaningful discussion, and then we end with one or two open-ended questions. So for All Shook Up, I'll just give an example of one of them. Uh, the singer talks about feeling shaky, weak, and tongue-tied because he's in love. Have you ever had strong feelings for someone that affected you physically? What were some of those feelings? And then we give prompts. We give examples on what some of those feelings might be. 
So uh, with this section of the book, we felt very strongly about bringing it back to what we do as therapists, but at the same time, giving it over to the caregiver, giving it over to the care partner and saying, how can you modify this so you can get a similar engagement that we see every day in our music, especially if your loved one is not as outgoing or if they're having difficulties with communication, um, you know, you're able to kind of use these discussions as a guide to kind of take you through the music. Um, and, and that's really the goal is to meaningfully engage uh, each other, not only uh, the person living with dementia, but as well as their caregiver and just to have a meaningful experience. We really thought about this uh, in terms of anybody being able to just grab the book and go, you know, just take the book and, you know, you've got your phone, you've got a computer, you've got an iPad, a tablet, uh, and you could just literally look up a song, whether it's on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music, you know, um, so you could pull up the song, play it, and then go. So that's, that's, that was really the goal, you know, no matter if you're a professional in the field, if you're a grandchild of someone living with dementia, if you are a spouse or a sibling, um, was to take the music further. And so that's what we did in the third section of the book. So. Okay, I think um, we're gonna open it up for questions because we'd really like to hear from you guys, um, some of the questions that you have from us um, and really more as a chance, not just for us to directly answer questions, but to di dialogue with you all. Um, and if you have questions or concerns to kind of go back and forth to guide you for solutions. Um, but before we do that, I wanna just give you a few practical steps because um, you've heard about how great music is with dementia. And of course we've talked about our book, which we would of course love for you to buy and use. Um, but I, I would, I really, my goal would be for you to leave this webinar with just a few simple practical ways um, that you can look at using music uh, with your loved one. Um, so first and foremost, I would say no matter where you are on the journey of dementia, it's never too late to start using music. So my, my biggest, if you take one thing away, just start, just start listening to music together, start trying to play a few songs um, that you think that you either know that they love or you think they might. If you are just completely in the dark about their musical preferences, look at their, uh, what was popular when they were between the ages of 18 or 25 start there. That's always a great place to start um, and just kind of see what they respond to and go from there. So I, that would be my number one. If my number one takeaway is just start using it, start going for it. Yeah. If you don't buy the book 18 to 25, just start with that. Start with that music. Carrie, did you want to say something? I just wanted to add one thing to that too, is that with somebody living with dementia, they're in a different reality, um, moment to moment, day to day, week to week. So also remember that, you know, if they love a song one day and they don't care for it another, you didn't do anything wrong. So going back to what Meredith says, the trial and error and just trying it, you know, and that's like us. Think about what you like to listen to and when you like to listen to it. Uh, and so that's what I would say about music as well. You know, try to provide variety and really try different things out. And if something works one day, that's great. It might not work the next day, but you know, jot it down, make a list, and you can always revisit it in a few days, in a few weeks, that sort of a thing. Yeah, and so I was gonna say, I would start with music between, when they were between the ages of 18 and 25. The next music I would try is the music that was popular when their parents were that same age range. Um, this is something, the 18 to 25 rule gets talked about a lot. I've seen it a lot more in the literature. Um, I, you do see mentions of people loving their parents' music, uh, but I know from personal experience, I know from talking with friends and working with clients, uh, most people would be surprised to learn, like, I love John Denver and Simon and Garfunkel and the Beach Boys, who were all popular before I was even born, but that's because I listened to it growing up with my parents, so that's another good place to start. Um, the next thing I would really encourage you to do, and Kara kind of touched on this, is start a list and don't delay on this. Start right away a list of songs that your loved one likes, that they love, that they respond to. Um, if they're in early stages of dementia, this is really crucial. Start putting together that list when they can tell you what they like. Um, because a lot of times we get called someone in a later stage of dementia, we, we have to use a guess and check method, right? And we, we have the research, we have the resources to make an educated guess going in, and that's very helpful, but it's still guess and check. So I think that the number two thing you can do is start that list and start it now. 
Um, something we always tell caregivers, something we do ourselves is start that list and write down the songs that they love. But then also if there is a key association with that song, write it down um, because that is going to be a really valuable resource for you later. Um, it'll be a valuable resource for anybody um, that's caring for your loved one later as well. And so if they say, oh, I love this song, we played it at our wedding, write it down, write it down that it was a song that they played at their wedding. Um, and if they are able to dialogue with you and kind of share their favorites, that's awesome. Go ahead and write it down. If not, like Tara says, Keep, just keep a little bit of a journal, a little bit of a diary of writing down the songs that they respond to, recognizing they might not always respond to the same song over and over again, but that list is really going to help you out. And if they do share a memory of like, oh, I remember this played on our first date, or oh, we listened to this when we went on vacation every year, or whatever it is, then later when they hear that song and they maybe are having a harder time sharing that memory, you know what to prompt them with and say, oh, does this song remind you of dad? Didn't you listen to this on your first date? Because you, you have that information. Um, and I know this is something that's being talked about across the country. Wisconsin has actually done work to include preferred music as part of their advanced directive paperwork um, to actually say, when you are preparing, when you are writing these things down, your musical preferences, that's where it belongs. Um, and then the other thing I would encourage you is if you do develop that list, whether through talking with your loved one or jotting notes, make it very easy to share with others. Um, if they are in long-term care, if they have someone from home health that's with them during the day, um, anybody that's spending significant time, make that list readily available to them because they can be using it too. Um, and they can say, if you have a home health worker that's there, they can say, hey, let's listen to some music or whatever. They can be incorporating it as well. Um, so I think those are things that you can be doing um, today right away to say, how can we, we can use music. And I don't know if Kathy and Tara have anything they want to add. Yeah, I would just add to, um, especially as the disease progresses, you're going to see different emotions and different emotional reactions from the music. So if you know that um, Always by Irving Berlin was uh, their wedding song, and maybe they're no longer verbal, but they're getting emotional, then you have a, a, a pretty good idea as to why, instead of just guessing. And then you can kind of guide that interaction in that way. Um, and we go into that a little bit in the book about different emotional responses, about how, you know, you don't always get a positive response from music and, and what do you do? Um, so I do think, you know, having that list and then sharing it, as Meredith said, with as many people as possible, it gives more people information to engage with your loved one. And that also goes if they're in long-term care, if they're in a community setting and the activities director has that list when an entertainer comes in. If mom or dad or your brother or sister is no longer verbal, but they love music, they can ask that entertainer, can you play always? This is a very important song to this person, you know? And as an activities director, I loved having that information, having it in their care plan. It went everywhere. You know, the CNAs who cared for them knew what their favorite songs were. Also, my background as a music therapist helped with that, but they knew what their favorite songs were. So when they were providing care, they could sing with them. They could put on music while they were doing care. Um, you know, so there are lots of different ways you can incorporate music, not only if you're caring for someone in the home, but if you have that information and they are in long-term care or they transition to long-term care, that information becomes so valuable throughout uh, the progression of the disease and as your loved one is living moment to moment uh, with dementia, so. And I was just going to piggyback off of that again um, with the different emotions, just because a song doesn't invoke a positive emotion doesn't mean it's out of bounds for you. Yeah. And it is, we don't all always feel happy all the time. We just don't. And so if you only keep a list of positive, happy, super wonderful songs and someone's having a bad day and you come in there, oh, we're just going to listen to positive, happy, perky songs. And that's what I know you like. You're not going to get the same response. So write it down if it doesn't get a perky, happy, make me get out of the chair and dance response the same way you would if it does. And that's also good information for the activities directors, for caregivers, for the staff to have, because that way they know too what all of the other responses are going to be. This song invokes a strong response. And if that's not advisable right now, then maybe that's a song to stay away from today versus a song to play today. 
And I think the other key is to remember we talk about positive and negative emotional responses. A negative emotional response isn't necessarily bad. Right. Um, we we all need to cry sometimes. <laughs> um, and crying can be very therapeutic, right? Like if we have these sad emotions, we need an outlet. We need to be able to express that. Um, obviously, we don't want to keep them in a place where they're sad all the time. But if that's what they're feeling, we want to come alongside with music and support that and let them express that, let them cry. Just a lot of times, you know, we get uncomfortable when someone else has a negative emotional reaction, right? We're like, oh boy, like we sort of we want to kind of make it stop, right? Like we want to make them better. But I think when you don't know what to do, just be present with them in that moment, be there with them. And I think that's usually all you need to do. Um, and I think the other thing to really remember is crying can be happy tears too, right? Like, you know, we tend to think of tears as a negative emotion, but you know, we also cry, cry when we're happy or we're happy recalling a memory. And sometimes crying is complicated. Crying is like, we're happy recalling our wedding day and we're sad because our spouse is no longer here and it's a whole like mess of emotions. Um, but at the same token, when we're experiencing those, we're staying in touch with our loved ones, we're staying in touch with our memories and with who we are. Um, and the really the goal of music is to facilitate that process, um, to experience those emotions, to work through those emotions, to be supported in those emotions. Um, and then to move, you know, to move beyond them. So we're not just, we're not just crying all day. So I think recognizing that there are going to be a variety of emotional responses, but that's healthy and that's normal. Um, and the goal for you and the goal for the music is just to support them through that. All right. Are we ready to take some questions? Does anyone have questions for us? We'd love to hear them. I think Alex is manning the chat box. Um, and then she also said, uh, you can do the raise hand button if you want to unmute yourself and that way we can kind of hear what kind of questions are out there. And maybe while we're waiting for questions, um, um, any other anecdotal stories? Um, well, that, I was going to say, we helpful. have a few questions for our participants. If oh, great. Let's do that. That might, that might help. Um, our first question would be for participants is, what is one thing that you wish was going more smoothly in your loved one's life? Um, and like, let's talk about how maybe music could make it better. So maybe for example, um, they're struggling with an activity of daily living. Um, they might be resistant to receiving care from others. Um, if you have a home health worker or long-term care, or they're resistant to having assistance with bathing, um, or they feel very anxious um, during certain times of the day or during a trip to the doctors. Um, what is one, one thing where you're like, oh, if this, this thing could be more smooth or if this thing could be easier, we would love to hear what it is. And then we can talk about some ways you could use music um, to help make that easier, to make that more comfortable, make it even enjoyable with music. Does anyone have a situation that they wish was easier as part of their caregiving? Got a quiet bunch today. That's okay. All right, we've got caregiving utopia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah. As far as ADLs go, there are a lot of different ways you can incorporate music, but going back to their preferred music, going back to what we talked about earlier, um, you can use music in a lot of different ways. Um, I, I want to highlight bathing quickly just because that becomes an extremely challenging activity and um, those living with dementia become very resistive to that. Um, you know, if you think about it, it's a very private and personal activity. And now you've got somebody else in the room with you who is seeing you. Oh, and I see starting the day and getting out of bed. I'll, I'll get to that too. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, as far as bathing goes, a great way to use music to make it more of an uncomfortable and inviting environment is using their preferred music and having everything set up ahead of time if you can. So make sure the temperature in the bathroom is good. Make sure the temperature in the water is going. Play the music. You know, have towels and everything ready. And then maybe have your loved one, you know, dress into a robe. And then as they hear the music, sing with them. Dance with them. Encourage them into the bathroom. And spend some time really enjoying the music before you get to the part to where you've got to bathe them. And, of course, that's going to look different. Um, in a lot of different ways. I currently do a telehealth session um, with a client who, um, as she's getting her morning care, she's starting her day. Um, she is, uh, for the most part, unresponsive at times. 
Um, so I play music along with the caregiver who's providing care for her. And, you know, the idea is to give her a positive supporting environment while she's having this care done. And I work with the caregiver and we're talking to one another and we're talking to the client and we're providing this supportive environment, uh, which gives her not only a great start to her day, but it also gives her an opportunity to engage during a part of the day that maybe she's uncomfortable or doesn't really want to do. Uh, so that would be kind of my, my other mention on, you know, using music to kind of start the day, so to speak, while you're doing some of those activities of daily living. Um, I'm not sure if Meredith or Kathy have anything to add to that. Yeah, I was going to add, um, there actually have been research studies that have been done. Um, I think it was specifically done on bathing routines, and it was not done with music therapists. It was just used with caregivers. And it was really simple. They tracked um, behaviors and how smoothly things went and found that when caregivers with essentially no musical training, they don't have a background in music therapist, like their professional caregiver, when they had them sing during bathing routines, it went much more smoothly. Um, and this is something um, as we work, um, we do provide music therapy services and long-term care. We love to talk with staff about because um, if we can make those uh, activities of daily living and those routines smoother, um, for us, it's really a ripple effect, right? Because if you have um, one, one patient who's frustrated, and with good reason, I mean, I don't blame them. They're frustrated. They don't want to take a bath. They don't trust the stranger that's there to assist them. So they start resisting. They start pushing back that patient is not having a positive experience, right? They're not having a relaxing shower. They're not enjoying the fact that they're getting fresh and clean and ready for the day. They're starting their day off with tension and fear and anxiety and being uncomfortable and maybe combative. So they're not having a positive experience, right? They're already upset. And by the time they leave that bath situation, they're gonna carry those negative emotions like on into their day, right? But it's not just about them, it's about the caregiver, right? And caregivers are fantastic and they're patient, but it wears on you when you've got a patient and you're trying to be loving and you're trying to be helpful and you're trying to respect them and they're potentially being combative and being resistant, then your job gets harder. Um, and so you might be more in defensive mode or now you're running behind schedule because that took longer than it should have because uh, the patient was having a difficult time. And then that caregiver is going through the rest of their day with those negative emotions as well. But if we can take that and say, okay, the music helped, the music made it more positive, the music relaxed everyone, that patient is having a better day. Like they started off, they're feeling happier, but also that caregiver is gonna have an easier time with their workload. And that ripple effect is gonna spread, you know, through the long-term care, because as each of those individuals interacts with other people in their community, those emotions are gonna kind of keep going out. And so I think that for me is a huge thing is, it's just one simple act, right? Just one simple thing, just singing, just using music during a bath, but then the ripple effect goes kind of through the whole community. Yeah, and it builds, it, it builds, oh, sorry, it builds a relationship to, to where it's now a positive experience. So a lot of times, especially in long-term care, um, an individual will see a caregiver and they know why they're coming to see them. That's the one who gives me the medicine. That's the one who gives me my bath. That's the one who takes me to physical therapy that I don't want to do. You know, so they, they start associating them with the things that are challenging and frustrating. So if you can incorporate music into that, then that becomes a more meaningful connection with that caregiver to, to piggyback off of what Meredith was saying. It builds that relationship differently and then that spreads. And that's the same for when you're doing ADLs in the home if you're caring for somebody. Um, I'm seeing in the question and answer box here, from Melissa, thank you. The biggest issue is patience to cultivate more within myself and create calm. Um, and I can't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, each and every day, uh, you know, you're giving so much of yourself. And, you know, that patience, we all have our tolerance level, right? Uh, not only us as caring for others, but when we're being cared for. Uh, and so if music can help facilitate that, and make it a little easier, whether it's doing an activity of daily living, whether it's, you know, you're trying to get them to walk more. So singing when the saints go marching in as you're walking around the neighborhood or bringing your phone with you, um, you know, and playing music while you're walking around to encourage exercise. There's lots of studies there about how music, um, while you're exercising, you can go longer. You know, your, your endurance, uh, the redirection of, you know, Maybe you hate exercising, but now you're redirected and focused on the music and 
uh, that's true with some of these activities of daily living as well. And to piggyback off that, I know we three as music therapists, this is our career, this is our job, we are very comfortable saying, well, just sing along, just sing to them. That's a terrifying thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a terrifying thing for someone who's not trained. It's a terrifying thing for you to ask your, your loved one to do with you. That's okay. We didn't say just sing along like you're going to win American Idol with them. Mm -hmm. just, just sing. And, and the recorded music too is a great starting point. I love that Kathy mentioned that point because if you're not comfortable singing, then don't start there. Start with the recorded music. If you are comfortable singing, you are my sunshine, start with that. See what happens. Or Do sing along with the recorded music. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Encourage them to sing, move, clap your yep. hands, dance. And you might feel silly doing it. And they might think that you're silly for doing it. But at the same time, it, it'll have an effect. And we as a society judge that too hard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, I was going to say, too, I saw the question come in um, about getting up and getting out of bed. Um, and I think Tara talked about this a little bit with her client. Um, I think sometimes those issues are those, those morning routines can be difficult or challenging. Um, but I have like one specific client story. I had a client that I worked with um, that was unmotivated sometimes in the morning to get up and get out of bed. Um, but we had kind of worked through a preferred playlist with her and she had a couple songs that without fail, every time they came out, she'd be like, oh, I'm moving, I'm grooving. Like they would pep her up every single time she had songs when she was getting upset that every single time would kind of like she would calm down so i shared that um she lived in a community and i shared that with staff there and said literally it's like these three songs are irresistible to her <laughs> like she cannot help but dance and that's what they did in the morning when she needed to get up it was like boom turn it on and she'd be like Ooh, oh yeah i like to dance to this and um and want to get up so um I think there are times, like if you can find some of those energetic songs that they love, that they love to move with, that would be a great thing. Um, if the issue is being motivated to get up and get out of bed, I think if the issue um, is some of those other things like we've talked about, like not that they necessarily are having trouble getting up and getting moving in the morning, but that they don't like their morning, um, then I think incorporating music to make some of those routines of dressing, bathing, teeth brushing, you know, whatever their morning routine is, to make it an enjoyable routine, um, I think will help as well, so. So with the few minutes left, if there's any additional questions, um, please feel free to chat them. We will be following up with an email um, with all of the resources that Tara had mentioned. Um, I will also include or re-include the link um, to purchase the book. Um, as a reminder, we have additional resources uh, for family caregivers at HFC. Um, you can visit us at www.wearehfc.org. And Meredith, I think you had one other resource you wanted to share. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I actually own music therapy company, North Austin Music Therapy. And I do believe that um, like my website and possibly my email is being included in the follow up. But I wanted to encourage people that even though we're based here in Austin, we're based here in Texas, um, still feel free to reach out. Um, I talk with a lot of families and a lot of caregivers um, from places all over the country. And our goal is really um, to guide you to finding the resources and solutions that you need. Um, so even if you are not in our geographic area, please don't let that stop you from contacting us. I would still love um, to talk with you about your loved one, with your situation, what you're looking for. Um, and the music therapy world is small and I've been around for a while and so is Terry and Kathy. So we know lots of therapists in other parts of the country if that's what you're looking for. Um, because we're sort of in this industry, we know the ins and outs maybe a little more than someone that's kind of just coming in as a caregiver and it's a whole new experience. Um, our goal is to really guide you for resources and solutions. So if you have questions that come up after this, or you are looking for more help or music therapy services, please feel free to contact us, even if you live on the other side of the United States. We're still more than happy to chat, more than happy to guide you um, to resources in your area, if that's what you're looking or, for as well. Yeah, or in Canada. I know we had a viewer here from yeah. Canada. We know music therapists in Canada. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we actually want that to stop you uh, if you want to reach out and contact us. Uh, you know, as Meredith said, the music therapy community is small and uh, we are mighty. You know, we we, uh, you know, we would love nothing more than to connect you with somebody in your area to provide services for you and help guide you 
um, through that process if you feel music is important and valuable to your loved one. Thank you all so much. And if any caregivers on today um, end up with inspiring stories from incorporating music, please share them with us. We'd love to be able to share um, those magic moments. Aha, uh -huh, that's a little pun there to the song. Um, those magic moments with Kathy, Tara, and Meredith. Um, also on our website, we do have a storytelling page. So please feel free to share your stories there as well. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. Um, what a great way to start the weekend. Um, and we look forward to seeing folks uh, on future webinars. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having it. us. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy your day, everybody. All right.